I'd like to begin by basically talking about the word liturgy, just to kind of set you in the, uh, in the frame of what liturgy is about. And if we want to come to a definition of liturgy, then we have to more or less have a, a certain, a, a very broad overview of what, where is the word coming from, where, how do we use it, when did we start using it, and, and so forth. It was not, it had not been used as we use it today, especially in our official documents of the church to designate uh, this word for um, for divine worship, it is basically 20th century term. But it's not a new word. Uh, the word has, was used even before Christ by uh, the, uh, uh, the Greek uh, culture because it is actually a word that we took from them. Um, the word uh, liturgy is formed out of two words, laos and ergos. The first word, lit, let, liter, laos, which you must be familiar with because we have taken that word from the Greek that means laity, laos, people. Lay people, laity. And ergos means work, the work of the people. And it was used in ancient Greece to determine any kind of work of the community, whether it was religious work, as far as anything that had to do with uh, any festivities or festivals that had to do with their gods and whatever the people did to work to celebrate that, that was, that was called liturgy. But if it was uh, a, a term used for um, civil service, of the people, they use the word liturgy. If it was uh, the word uh, used for social work towards the good of the community, and it was done by the community, they used the term liturgy. Whether it was in the religious sense, it was whether it was in the uh, uh, civil sense, or whether it was used in the social sense. Now. Uh, the, uh, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures, it was never translated into any other languages but uh, Hebrew. It was the Jewish people of what we call the diaspora, the people that went to live in the different parts of the Roman Empire, but they were not living anymore in Israel. They, the, peop the Jewish people of the diaspora, their first language did, was not Hebrew anymore, but it was Greek their first language. So, uh, there were 70 uh, scribes of the diaspora, mainly living in Alexandria, Egypt now, but at that time was one of the most important cultural centers of the Roman Empire. Those 70 scribes took the task of translating the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. So whatever the term was in Hebrew 
for worship, for service of God, they translated it into Greek as liturgy. Because uh, they that was the, the closest word that they could find for uh, the service of the Levites, especially uh, the priestly people of the people of Israel. Now, but in the West, the word was not, was entirely unknown. So, what in the West, the development of, um, well, let me go back to the first centuries of Christianity, even to the translation of the New Testament or the creation of the New Testament, which was Greek. They used the term liturgy which was not limited to worship. Any service that had to do with the service of the gospel to evangelize was used as liturgy. It was a service done by the community to spread the good news. So it was not limited to worship or to anything that had to do with cultic um, uh, terminology. So, yes, in the New Testament, in Greek, you will find the word liturgy, but not necessarily had to do with worship. Then later on in the Middle Ages, what did they use for what we now know as liturgy? It was, they used the term, the divinis offices, about the divine office. We now think of divine office as the liturgy of the hours, but not in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages have to do with anything that had to do with worship, anything about the, that it was the divinis the Divinis Offices was about what we think of now, modern days, liturgy. Or the other term that they used in the Middle Ages was the Ecclesiastes Offices. The office of the church, about the, about the office of the church. And then, uh, when... Uh, the, ref the reform came, the Protestant reform, and then the Counter-Reformation came, and then uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, Council of Trent as the Counter-Reformation uh, came with some liturgical reforms. They used the term the Ritibus, Ritibus, Ritibus Ecclesiae about the rights of the church. But, they, but the, word, the term liturgy did not, did not exist. Or also the other term was the sacris ritibus, the, sacri, the sacris ritibus, which is about the sacred rite. It was in 1588, that the term liturgy was f first used in the West, but it was only and exclusively used for Mass, for the Mass. It was not used as a whole for any liturgical action. But when they used this term in 1588, which it was the end of the uh, 16th century, it was only to this designate the celebration, the rites of the liturgy of the Eucharist or the liturgy of Mass. Now, in the East, 
They used the word divine liturgy throughout the centuries. What is now the Orthodox Church or the other Eastern rites of the Catholic Church in the East, especially the Byzantine rite. They always use, they never departed from the word divine liturgy, but when they talked about the, the divine liturgy, it was, it, they meant the Mass. It did not mean any of the other sacraments or any of the other uh, liturgical celebrations. But only when they talked about the divine liturgy, they meant Mass, the Mass. It was not until the end, uh, no, the 19th century, in the 19th century, it began, these were the precursors or the forerunners of what it will become later in the 20th century, uh, the liturgical movement. There was a liturgical movement, but it began with some ideas that came from some forerunners. Uh, in the 19th century, that they begin to use the term liturgy in the sense that we use it today. Today, in any liturgical documents of the church, when they mean divine uh, 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 worship, and when they mean any uh, liturgical rites or any of the um, of the liturgical action, they use the word not anymore any of those terms, but the word liturgy. Yes. Was there something that happened in 1588, a council? I'm thinking about Protestant Reformation around that time as well. Um, I don't know if it was influenced by by that, or also some exposure to the East that they use the term divine liturgy to designate only the celebration of Mass, that this term was, was used uh, for the first time, but only limited. But I don't know really if he had to do, I doubt that he had to do anything with the Protestant Reform, because the Protestant Reform was not so much concerned about liturgy as we Catholics do. They were more about Scripture only. And uh, there was the, that, they, it was their sole preoccupation. And so, but I, I, I don't know if he had to do with some kind of influence that in the East they used, they always use divine liturgy mass, equal mass, and here the first time in 1588, liturgy equals mass. But was there a council or something that the bishops met at? The, it was the council earlier, okay. the... Um, uh, what is called the Trent Council, the Council of Trent, but they did not use the term. They used the Ridibus Ecclesia and the Sacris Ridibus. Yeah. So throughout, throughout the the uh, uh, the, um, the, ref the liturgical reforms, and by liturgical reforms, I am using the modern term of. The Council of Trent, they use those terms of the 16th century. The Ridibus Ecclesia, the Sacris Ridibus. Anyway, uh, 19th century, it begins with uh, some of the thinking 
um, otherwise, let me see if I can express it in a, in a better way. Up to the 19th century, liturgy or any of the readables ecclesia the, the, about the rites of the church, of the, about the sacred rites, was exclusively thought not as in the way we will see that we think of liturgy, but they were thinking of, li of liturgy as a list, a long list of rules, a long list of uh, rubrics. Anyone who was specialized during the 16th century until the 19th century and who was specialized in liturgy, they were specialized in knowing all the rules, all the rubrics of how we celebrate liturgy. For them, that was it. It was almost like anything that was exterior to the appearance of the ritual movements of the liturgy. Meaning, you have to do this in this moment, you have to do that in this, in this other way, you have to hold your hands exactly in this distance from your uh, hands to the, uh, to the uh, shoulder, you have to keep your fingers always uh, close because if you have already touched the sacred uh, body of Christ, the particles may have attached and you cannot detach those fingers. You have to keep them together until the purification. So it was those kind of rules that they thought of liturgy of. It was not until the beginning of, uh, and, and during the 19th century that these precursors or these forerunners of the liturgical movements begin with the idea, wait a minute, liturgy, or when we celebrate any of these rites, is more than rules. It's about celebrating the mystery. That was the first thought of the liturgical movement, to celebrate the mystery of the presence of God among us. So then it, it began to go further than just exterior performance of the liturgy. But what is really happening in when we celebrate the liturgy? And then comes the 20th century and it begins the liturgical movement. The liturgical movement, there were many um, thinkers, theologians, that were very interested in uh, moving towards a theology of the liturgy. Theology of the liturgy that, that never, it was never thought of before. The theology of the liturgy, which will be saying basically the, the, the principle of uh, lex orandi, lex credendi. The rule of prayer is the rule of belief. What we what we Pray is what we believe. Lex orandi, lex credendi. And some popes went along with this liturgical movement. The main two popes that contributed to this liturgical movement were two pious. Pius X and Pius XII. Pius X 
by, with this liturgical reform, what he encouraged in some of his encyclicals was people should sing at Mass. Participation, which was totally foreign before in liturgy, participation. People should sing at Mass, or people should sing in any of our liturgical actions. It was, it was not thought of it before. Participation of the people was not looked at as, at it as essential to the liturgy. Essential was whatever the priest did, it was what, what it, it mattered. The people really were more like spectators. This was prior to Vatican II, then. Of course. But when Vatican II comes, we think many times that Vatican II did all these reforms like out of their <laughs> sleeves. No, it was a movement that had begun in the 19th century. Then it, it evolved in the, in the 20th century with uh, the liturgical reform that also some of the popes begin encouraging this, this uh, change, reforms in liturgy. So there are certain things that, that uh, Pope the Pius pushed forth for liturgical reforms, participation of the people in singing, participation of the people in taking communion. The people went to Mass but did not take communion. And the other was, he is the one who started First Communion for the kids at the age of reason, Pius X, in the beginning of the, the 20th century. He's the Pope of the First World War. So the, the Pope of the First World War, Pius X, with this ways of encouraging participation in the liturgy, and then in the Second World War comes Pius XII. Pius XII um, well, okay, Just hold on to this, and I will get more to it. But let me just introduce this. Pius XII was the first pope to write an encyclical exclusively to treat the subject of liturgy. And this subject of liturgy uh, was treated in the encyclical that is called Mediator Day, Mediator Day. Um, which you have it right there, Mediator, Mediator, Mediator Day. We say it in, in kind of in the accent in English, but in Latin is media, Mediator Day. It was the first encyclical in which it's just talked about the liturgical reform of the church. So the liturgical reform is not exclusive of Vatican II. Pius XII, among many other things, in this encyclical introduces one idea that is really a chain, a kind of helping us to think of more what liturgy is about. Not only the definition that he gives us that is very key to the later reforms that we will find in Vatican II, but one idea, which is the name, uh, uh, well, no, wait. One of the ideas is the people, the assembly, is the body of Christ. The assembly is the mystical body of Christ. Before, as I told you, the people were not looked, or the assembly was not looked at as an essential part of the liturgy because they never thought of the 
of the assembly being the body of Christ. But with the idea of saying, oh, the assembly is the body of Christ, then the assembly is not to be passive, but is to participate as part of the body of Christ in if Christ is the one, the main actor of the liturgical action of offering a uh, of offering a praise to God or offering sacrifice to God, then the assembly is an essential part of the liturgical action. I hate, I hate to keep asking all these questions. But it's okay. It brings to mind to me when I was young that the priest on their day off would celebrate Mass by themselves mm -hmm. without any congregation with them. Does that still happen today? It can happen. It's not encouraged. Okay. But the priest still holds the right to celebrate Mass when there is, no, when there is absence of an assembly. But it is encouraged that whenever possible, should avoid and celebrate Mass with the ideal is to celebrate Mass with the assembly, with the body of Christ, uh, not only the head. Uh, so uh, this is one of the, the, uh, the things that is very important in terms of participation. The assembly is the mystical body of Christ. Therefore, their participation is essential to the liturgical action because if we looked at the definition, then we will see, oh, is the action, is the work of Christ. But anyway, let's look at first the definition of liturgy. With the first attempts of uh, uh, of coming with to with a definition of liturgy in this liturgical movement was not an easy task because like like I said it was the beginning of treating liturgy as not as something exterior exterior is whatever um, may uh, will be what we use for ornaments, what we use for decorations, what we use as some of uh, the, um, the, the, the uh, exterior signs, but it never went deeper than that of saying the liturgical action is more than that. And so to, to start with a definition was quite a challenge for the liturgical movement. And so some of them did not really come up with an ideal uh, definition. Actually, Pius XII will say, for example, that some of the first attempts at a definition will come short and he will say it is an error and a mistake to think of the sacred liturgy as merely an outward or visible part of the divine worship or as an ornament or ornamental ceremonial Liturgy is not only that, he will say. Not, not less erroneous is the notion that it consists solely in a list of laws, in a list of rubrics. You shall do this, you shall do that, you shall not do this. It's, it's as equally erroneous to think that liturgy is a list of laws and prescriptions according to which the ecclesiastical hierarchy orders the sacred rites to be performed. He says, that is not liturgy. So then what is liturgy? And he will start with the idea in his encyclical, 
mediator day with this one. The, litur the liturgy is nothing more nor less than the exercise of the priestly function of Christ. Okay, what does that really mean? Let us first go to the idea of what is a priestly function. A, priest, a priestly function is the one that closes the gap between God and humanity. So that then there is an encounter of the people, the assembly, with the divine. That's a priestly function. And the only one that can do in our liturgy that priestly function is Christ. Our pontifex, our bridge. Christ is the only bridge that closes the gap between us and God the Father. And it is through Christ with the action of the Holy Spirit. But it is Christ the main actor. So then one of the revolutionary ways of thinking of liturgy is we are not the actors. No matter what, what ministry, liturgical ministry you have, you are not the actor. Not even the priest is the main actor, but Jesus Christ. Obviously, the priest does in persona Christi the function of facilitating as a minister that Jesus Christ will be the mediator between God and us. So the priestly, so liturgy is nothing less, nothing more than the exercise of the priestly minister or the exercise of the priestly function of Christ. So liturgy, no matter from what perspective you look at it, it will be always the priestly function of Christ. Whether it will be a baptism, whether it will be the celebration of Mass, whether it will be uh, any sacrament, whether it will be the liturgy of the hours, always Christ will be the mediator between us and God. That's what liturgy uh, comes at the end of the day, is having the mediator Christ between us and God. Otherwise, by ourselves, we will not be able to be in contact with the sacred. And Jesus will say it, no one can come to the Father except through me. I am the way. I am the bridge. He, obviously, he's talking about, in, in a sense, of he is the means of salvation. Well, liturgy is about celebrating our salvation. There is nothing else that we truly do in liturgy but celebrating how Jesus has saved us through his passion, death, and resurrection. Again, you name any liturgical action, whether it's sacraments, including, of course, obviously the center of all the sacraments, the, 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 uh, the Eucharist, but any other liturgical actions. They are about God's saving presence among us. And so, this definition will help later on to, well, to define in a more precise way what is liturgy when it comes to the definition of liturgy in the document of Second Vatican Council, the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy. The Constitution of, on the Sacred Liturgy, they will give us the principles of what is, what is liturgy. So after Pius X says, the people are the body of Christ, 
and liturgy is the action of Christ as a priest, then if we make conclusion, we'll say, ah, is the function of Christ. People are the body of Christ, therefore their participation is essential to the liturgy. Not anymore as mere expectators, as it was done before. The priest will do some prayers that even people will not even, they couldn't even hear them in, in, in the uh, in the, even the, during the Middle Ages, as well as with the Tridentine Rite. It was almost like there were two liturgies. The liturgy of the priest and the liturgy of the people. What was the liturgy of the people? Praying the rosary while they were hearing Mass, or doing some prayers or some novenas. Because... First of all, they couldn't hear what the priest was saying. Secondly, even if they will hear, they will not understand because it was Latin. So they could not participate in the, in the, in the way that later on uh, the Vatican II will say it is essential that people will participate in any liturgical action uh, in um, the participation that it will be conscious, active, and full. Full, conscious, and active participation. If it's going to be full, then they better sing. They better uh, do the gestures. They better participate in the dialogue. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give. It is right and just. Full participation. Conscious. Let's come to the realization of what we are doing. We are entering into this sacred exchange between God and us. Conscious, full, and active. Active doesn't mean that you are to be busy bodies in the liturgy. Active means that you sing, that you kneel down, that you stand up, that you give yourselves the, the, the uh, uh, exchange of peace, that you do anything that the liturgy is asking you to do. That is, uh, that is active, not, oh, it says active. Oh, we, 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 uh, we want to have uh, many people participating in the proclamation. So in one reading, seven people are going to read. <laughs> That's one person is enough. If people are listening, that's participating. If people are conscious, that is participating. If people get immersed into the sacred, into this encounter of the mystery that is participation. So participation is not doing things, is being immersed into the mystery of this encounter, which we will also see later on. So then uh, taking on, this, on that same principle of that definition, then Vatican II will come and say, liturgy in its entirety is a sacred sign. So it's more, as you can see, is more than rubrics, it's more than rules, it's more than a list of rubrics or more than a list of rules of what to do and what not to do and what are ornaments and so forth. In its entirety is a sacred sign it is the visible element of an efficacious sign of a supernatural reality. Which, what does that mean? Visible means that it that is perceivable, that you can perceive it through your senses. That is visible and natural. We will use natural elements to signify supernatural realities. 
Water is natural, but when it is sprinkled over our heads, it's not anymore. Just water is the grace of God that comes to sanctify us. When we take the body of the, the, this host that is wheat, it's not merely wheat. It's not merely bread. It's the body of Christ. That's the supernatural reality. It is a visible element, but it is an efficacious sign of a supernatural reality. Being anointed with the chrism is the sign of you are being sealed by the Holy Spirit. You're being consecrated. You are being taken to be part of the holy people of God. That is the supernatural reality, but the visible sign is the oil. Or is the touch in position of hands? Or is the smell of that holy oil that, is, that has the mirror and is, it smells beautiful? Or you smell the incense, but you, it, it comes through your senses in a natural way, but to signify a supernatural reality. That visible element varies according to what it signifies. So it's going to vary, the, the, the signs are going to vary. Water, bread, wine, oil. Uh, we hear also, we hear the word of God through our senses. All of those according to what they signify. One signifies the body of Christ, another signifies the, the blood of Christ, another signifies the seal of the Holy Spirit, another signifies the water that, that in which you are immersed so that you may be drawn and be dead to your old self so that you will come back a new person. In baptism, you died with Christ to rise with him to a new life. So the elements that you use are various. But it is analogous. But they are the same in the way that it is the presence of Christ and the action of the Holy Spirit. Various, what they signify, and at the same time, they are the same because they are, all of them, all of the signs that we use, those visible elements, they are all the same in the way that they all signify, they all are the presence of Christ and the action of the Holy Spirit. In that way, they are the same. In another way, they are different. Is that, is that clear, the difference between holy water for sprinkling or for baptism, holy oil, chrism, bread, wine, etc., etc., or even just other elements that are not visible, but they are, but they are perceivable to the senses as I've, you are forgiven of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You, it is a sacrament that came to you, not in a visible way, but in a perceivable way that it will be your hearing. Or when you hear human words and they tell you the word of God or the word of the gospel of the Lord. So there is yet the same analogous because it is the presence of Christ and the action of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Up to now, because we are ready to have our first break, any questions or comments?
not all at the same time. <laughs> I think, again, is that the work of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> the action? <laughs> again, if you, if you can see this uh, evolving of, uh, of, the, uh, of liturgy and the way in which we use it today, um, was not something thought about in a, in, a, in a very superficial way. It was really thought of very deeply, thinking about what is really happening within us when we enter into the mystery of the presence of God among us through any liturgical action. More than just do it and just follow the rules like if it will be some kind of magical but it is more this this action of Christ that he does the mediation he is the one that it is through him, with him, and in him that we are able to be immersed. And I mean not only to, do, to enter into this action, but to be immersed totally into the sacred mystery of the saving action of God towards us or for us. And at the same time, it's not only the, that, but then we are able to turn back to the Lord and say, thank you. Because you have been so good to us by giving us your salvation, by being an efficacious way or means of communicating to us your love. And the only thing that we can do in return to that action of God is by praising Him and giving Him thanks. That's basically we as the faithful is about the only thing that we can do. But even, even that, it can only be done through Christ. If we say thank you, it is Christ that takes it to the Father. If we are blessed, it is Christ that takes it to us. So whatever action is coming down from above or going up from us, always the mediator, mediator day, the, the, the mediator of, of God is Christ. That is why Christ is the only actor in our liturgical actions. We are only ministers and nothing else. Nothing else. We are ministers of the priestly... What happened there? <laughs> huh? And... Okay. Okay, so yeah. so through liturgy we receive God's grace. If we don't participate, if we're not actively participating, then we're missing out on the grace. Would you say that? Yes. Because whatever we do as as community, whether we do wonderful social work among the poor, whether we do wonderful evangelization, whether we do reach out to the needy, but what is constituting us to be ministers of, of that is the grace that we receive through the liturgy. The liturgy 
and nothing else will constitute us who we are. If we, if we are not baptized, we just simply cannot be part of the people of God. If we don't receive the body and blood of Christ, how do we have the strength to be active members out in the world? If we are not sanctified by the action of the Holy Spirit, how can we? We, we cannot give what we, cannot, what we do not have. And we have and we are who we are by the graces that we receive through the liturgical action. Father, um, this is not a technical question, it's more a practical one. Um, with all this uh, disaffiliation process that we're going through, especially in youth and young adults, uh, it is often uh, that we hear things like, well, the liturgy is boring, I, how do we engage youth, young adults, people? Obviously, the answer is not to make it more entertaining because it's not an act of entertainment. <laughs> exactly. But, but real, real uh, arguments where we can, that we can use to say, well, this is, this is what, what liturgy really is and this is why it's not entertaining or, yeah. or should not be boring. I think that in many ways, and that can take creative ways from our part in our uh, pastoral work to convey to the people, including especially youth, that the liturgy is something like a game. That if you're willing to play, you will learn to be immersed into the, that action. As long as you are there and not willing to be submerged into it, then you will remain a mere expectator. For example, let's take children. Have you, you all have the experience of looking or you were children, but you also have seen children at play. And there is one that is not willing to submerge him or herself into the, into the play. And so the other kids will take it on and just be transformed by their play. Have you seen them playing? house. Okay, I'm going to be dad, you're going to be mom, you're going to be, and so, and they take the role. And they are, I mean, and they are not laughing, they are not doing anything else that, that will say, eh, no, I cannot do it, no, 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 no. He says, okay, dad, breakfast is ready, come, children, come, and the kids will say, I don't like that. But if there is one that, right there that is saying, ha, 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 they will say, out. <laughs> then they will say, they will say that he will go crying. He will go crying to mom and say, they don't, want, they don't want me with them. And if mom or dad knows what is going on, says, because you don't know how to play. Learn to play and you will be just as, as immersed and entertained as they are. They kind of look at them and when they play, it's almost like they are into a different reality. When we enter into the liturgy truly and submerge ourselves into the sacred mystery, it's like being at play. You forget about everything else and just play. Just forget about, I cannot sing or I cannot do this or I cannot do that. Just, just do it. Nike. Eh? Nike says just do it. Right. <laughs> and you will see how 
no matter who, youth, young, adults, older, if they enter into the, into the play and submerged, they're just kind of, and it will be, to me, in many ways, it's, all, it's like the experience of Peter, James, and John. Transfiguration. They were taken and they were so much into it that they didn't want to get out of that. Why don't we stay here? It was such an amazing experience to see and contemplate the divinity that we want to stay here. There was, Jesus did not justify himself in this if you want to say liturgical action of Jesus of conveying his divinity to them, he did not explain to them, okay, is this boring for you? He just transformed, transfigured himself, and they were taken. So anybody, no matter the age, if we kind of, do well our liturgical action and allow them to immerse themselves, there is no explanation for, for, for the sacred, for the mystery. The mystery is just you, either, you, you live it or just don't. But allow them and, 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 uh, and, and facilitate that the liturgy will be the means of that Immersion. Many times, many times we think that we do the liturgy, we manipulate the liturgy to what we think it is good, and that's when people, people are not foolish. And they say, what is he doing? He thinks he's the actor. He thinks he's the one that the center of attention. Or this minister that comes and stands in, in, the, in the ambo and says, good morning, brothers and sisters. What are you doing? You are called not to be the center of attention. You're just called to read and proclaim the word of God. When the choir truly takes on his ministry, its ministry, the choir, of facilitating for people to sing rather than thinking that they are prima donnas, and thinking that we, they are performing, people will get it. But first, we ministers will have to know what is liturgy about. It's not about us. It's about the sacred mystery in which we are called to play and to be immersed, each one in his or her own role, but doing service to it, not serving ourselves. And if we do that truly, everyone will be able to immerse themselves into it. And then not, not think that this is an entertainment or this is some kind of show and, and kids are going to be entertained and, and they don't want to come because, oh, it's boring. Uh, if you're immersed into it, it will not be boring. But if you are there in liturgy, and we are all singing to the Lord, glory to God in the highest, and I am there like, think about it. Who is the person that is boring? The liturgy or the person that is refusing to play? Everyone is singing and I am just staring how boring I am when I do not emerge, submerge myself into the game, into the play of, this, of the sacred, of the liturgy. So let's play and forget about the rest and forget about... I, my mom brought me and so I am here. 
and I'm not going to sing, and I'm not going to uh, answer, and I'm not going to dialogue, and I'm not going to do anything. And uh, the, the word of God is proclaimed, but I'm not paying any attention of that. I'm thinking about I could have stayed in bed. If I am doing that, then I am refusing to enter. So we have to be, to be able to allow other people to say, come on, join us. Enter into, in, into this uh, uh, action of, in which we're going to encounter the Lord. If, if youth or any age want to, want to be like, we want to see Jesus, come on, join us, sing, listen to the word of God, praise the Lord, let us all join into this, and you will see. Come and see. Come and experience. That's about the only way I could answer to that. That will be always a pastoral challenge in the way in which we do liturgy thinking not that it is our action, it is the action of Christ. And that he comes and he transfigures himself to us, then we are to be taken into the sacred and say, oh, how good it is for us to be here, rather than how boring it is for us to be here. But it is boring because I refuse to enter into the mystery to emerge myself into it. Does that answer? Yes. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay, let's take a break and we will come back. Uh, we take a step back and look at the definition of Vatican II and how after defining Vatican II liturgy, then it will kind of dissected into the, the different uh, B, A, B, C, and D, uh, the liturgical action, it, what, it, what, is, what it implies, the, uh, the, the precise place and nature, what is the precise place and nature of the liturgy and, and to whom the liturgy belongs. But before that, and I went ahead of myself with uh, going first with B, the definition of liturgy. What is the definition of liturgy according to uh, the uh, Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, uh, Vatican II? And so I quote this definition from, from that document. Rightly then, the liturgy is considered as an exercise of the priestly office of Jesus Christ. Do you hear the echo of Mediator Day? So it begins by basically saying the same thing. Liturg the liturgy is considered as the exercise of the priestly office of Jesus Christ. In the liturgy, by means of signs perceptible to the senses, signs perceptible to the senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing, signs perceptible to the senses, um, human sanctification is signified and brought about in ways proper to each of these signs. Each of these signs will have a proper way to bring about the salvation. If it is the word of God that comes through the sense of hearing, it's a means of salvation. If it is the taste, unless you eat the, the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you shall not have life eternal. Eating the sense of taste. Uh, touch, imposition of hands, signing with holy oil of chrism, water, 
in baptism, water sprinkled in blessings, and, uh, and even just sight, we contemplate the beauty in the liturgy of the presence of God among us. That is why also sacred art in the liturgy is so important, because it is through our senses that we also contemplate that the beauty of, of the sacred, of the mystery. It's, it, so it is through those sensible means, human sanctification is signified and brought about in ways proper to each of the signs. In the liturgy, the whole public worship is performed by the mystical body of Christ. So here also the resonance of what already Mediator Day said, that the assembly is the mystical body of Christ. And so the liturgy says, is performed not only by the priest, but it is performed by the mystical body of Jesus Christ. That is, the head and his members. If, if the priest will signify the head, Jesus presiding, directing, our liturgy, the body, is signified by the assembly. The, and so it says, that is, the head and his members. So then, after giving us that definition, then he will talk about what we already have said. The liturgy in its entirety is a sacred sign with visible signs and that they are um, they signify the presence of Christ and the action of the Holy Spirit so that is B and then we have I mean A and now we have B B it says the liturgical action and I had already made reference to this. The liturgical action is our prayers arise to God and graces of redemption descend upon the church and its members. When I was talking to you about the, act, the priestly function of Christ being the mediator, Then uh, this mediation happens with this. What is the liturgical action? Our prayers, our worship, arise, go up. It's a movement of ascending and the movement of descending. The, The graces of redemption descend upon the church and its members. And so that is the liturgical action. If you, basically, if you want to uh, have a, a, a notion that you will not forget what is liturgy or what is the liturgical action, well, it is a movement our prayers going up to God and the graces of God descending upon us. Any liturgical action does that. Basically. And, uh, and so, just by looking at that, then you will come to the realization of how essential the participation of the members of the assembly is, how important their participation is. 
that is not solely the action of the priest, but the participation of the faithful with prayers of thanksgiving and praise to God ascending. And not even just thanksgiving and praise, but also petitions. But also asking for forgiveness. So all of those prayers ascend while we receive the saving grace of God. Amazing grace. Okay? And again, the mediator of this double movement is Christ, right there, the mediator, mediator Dei. The mediator of God is Christ, and that is his priestly function. That is his priestly work. Now, the precise place and nature of the liturgy is within the economy of salvation. What does it mean? First, let's talk about economy of salvation. What, what is economy of salvation? And what do we talk about when we talk about the economy of salvation? You know, it was taken not arbitrarily from the term that we are familiar with, economy. What is economy? Is the means in which a family will administer anything that is needed for the sustenance of the members of the family. So the, the economy of a household is how ma, mom and dad will make sure even with limited resources, that their kids and the whole family will have what they need to survive. If it is food, clothing, health, education, protection, all of that is within what we call the economy. And, you will, and the father or mother will have to make sure that in one way or another, all those needs are met. And so then if, it, if the resources are very scarce, then doing economy, saying, okay, we're going to economize right here so that you can have that. And we can then once we make sure that this is a basic need that is taken care of, and if we have more, then we will do the other. And so is kind of giving to them what they need. Salvation is in the same way how Christ makes sure that we have what we need for our salvation. So min administering what the People of God needs for the salvation, that's economy. Okay, they need baptism, let's give them baptism for, so that they may enter into, to be part of the holy people, to be part of the kingdom. They need nourishment of the body and blood of Christ, let's give them the Eucharist. They need the word of God as nourishment, Okay, here it is. Here's the table of the Word of God. Be fed at it. They need healing. Well, that we have spiritual healing by the sacrament of reconciliation. And we have healing by the anointing of the sick. You need to be strengthened in your love as you begin a Life together as husband and wife, let's administer that, uh, that bond of love by the sacrament of marriage. You need to be consecrated to be minister of the Lord. Let's administer holy orders to deacons, to priests, and to bishops. So, as the, and then we need to be constantly 
vigilant in prayer, be always praying. Okay, then we have this economy of salvation by the liturgy of the hours. Here it is. Morning prayer, intermediate hours, evening prayer, and night prayer. So the liturgy is placed within the context of the economy of salvation. So it comes to be what you were saying a, a, a minute ago, saying, okay, if we are done receive in the liturgy what, what we need, then where do we find our nourishment? It is only within the economy of salvation. It is within the liturgy only. Whether it will be uh, sacramental or non-sacramental. And even uh, even uh, we find personal nourishment in that in an economy of salvation as well will be personal prayer, but within the context of liturgy, it will always be communitarian. And so, liturgy cannot be thought of outside of the economy of salvation. So every time that we celebrate any liturgical action, it will be celebrating the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is through that Paschal mystery that salvation has been given to us. So that's, that's the center of the economy of salvation. Passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why liturgy will find its center in that mystery. Uh, and so, the liturgical action will always have that, uh, will have the, the place and the nature of it will be in the, the place is economy of salvation. The nature of the liturgy, the economy of salvation. Outside of it, it will have no sense. And then again, the participation of the people of God when, uh, when we are called to participate in the liturgy, full conscious and active participation in the liturgy is because the liturgy belongs to the Christian people by virtue of your baptism. By virtue of your baptism, you, we have all become uh, royal, royal priests. We enter into the royal priesthood of Christ, which is different to the uh, ministerial priest. The ministerial priest is the one that is ordained to do that ministry. But those who are baptized are priests. You are priest and priestess because you're able to be part of the kingdom of God and be able to offer sacrifice to the Lord. Obviously, under the direction and presidency of the ministerial priesthood. You don't go out and say, oh, Father says that we are priests and we can offer. No, <laughs> yes, we, are, we do it under the presidency and ministerial priesthood. Not all liturgies have to be presided by an ordained minister. There are certain liturgies that can be presided by a lay person, by a priest, a royal priest. 
For example, liturgy of the hours can be presided by a lay person. In the absence of a priest, a person can do a liturgy of the word with or without communion. In, in a danger of death, a lay person can do baptism. And so, most of the liturgical action is under the direction and presidency of the ministerial priesthood. But some liturgies are lay people are able to do, to perform, to 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 take also leadership in in in, in the in the uh, in the liturgical action. Now, because of this way of defining and finding the nature of the liturgy, then it, it came, if you want to say in this way, it came natural that a reform was needed so that, that that liturgy being belonging to the Christian people okay people are not participating fully consciously and actively in the liturgy as it is now well then, let us do the liturgy in a language that they can understand. Let us do the singing in a language that they can sing along with the choir being in the direction of, of, of that liturgy. Uh, let us go back before the, the Middle Ages up to the Middle Ages, between uh, the uh, apostolic times and the fathers of the church, the participation of the people was very essential. And actually, the books that symbolize the participation of the people in the Middle Ages had disappeared. But it didn't mean that they were not in existence before. What books were for the, of the people and that they disappear in the Middle Ages? The lectionary. The lectionary was the book of the lectors because they were the ones to proclaim the, the first and the second reading and the responsorial psalm. But in the Middle Ages, since the liturgy did not change from Latin to the vernacular, people were not able to read anymore because they did not speak or read or read Latin. So then who will proclaim the word of God? The one who was able to speak Latin, the priest. So instead of having one book, the priest being the one doing the proclamation of the word and being the one of presiding mass, then they said, why who? Will he be using two books? Let's merge it into one. So the, the Roman Missal had the readings. The book of the laity disappeared, the lectionary. The book of the permanent deacons disappeared, the, the book of Gospels. Why? Because they were not any more permanent deacons. And so who proclaimed the gospel? The priest. So then let's integrate the book of gospels into the Roman Missal. The people song before the Middle Ages. And they have the antiphones and the books were called antiphonaries. 
the people were not singing anymore. And sometimes masses were not sung if they didn't have a scola cantorum. So who did the antiphons? The priest. So the antiphonary was integrated into the Roman Missal. So throughout the Middle Ages, until Vatican II, lectionary, Evangel uh, uh, book of Gospels, antiphonary were all in one, the Roman Missal. Then comes Vatican II in the, the constitution of the sacred liturgy. They will give us the nature. What is liturgy? And say, if liturgy is saying that the people are the, the mystical body of Christ, then they are essential to, in, with the participation. If it's saying that liturgy belongs to the Christian people, then liturgy should be, they should partake on it. So then, what happened? Within the reform, there was a commission created that said, you go ahead and do the implementations that are needed according to these principles. And so the commission was called Concilium. Concilium was the one who will say, okay, people do not have a lectionary, let's create a lectionary. So then we have this lectionary that was not existent before Vatican II. It was not only that, but the lectionary was created in such a wonderful way that the readings of the scriptures became richer. Because in masses, no matter what mass, if it was a solemn mass or a regular mass, or it was only epistle and gospel. Now we have Old Testament, responsorial psalm, epistles or New Testament and gospel and they are all in the lectionary. They are not anymore in the missal. Then say, okay, we have deacons and their duty is to proclaim the gospel. Let's create a book for the deacons, the book of gospels. Here it is. Then the people are to sing, then the hymn books came. There were no hymn books, which took place of what it used to be, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the antiphonaries, hymnals now that we have. And uh, the greatest task was to translate the Roman Missal from Latin into the different languages. And so then it came the Roman Missal in Spanish, in English, in French, in German, in Italian, in all the languages, which before it was only Latin. That was it. But if but if we were going to be consequent with the concept of what liturgy is, then people should be able to participate, to uh, have full, conscious, and active participation. And that is why you will see that books that did not exist from the Middle Ages until the 20th century, but existed before, came back. So that this concept of liturgy will be implemented in how we do the liturgical action. And, uh, and so then also part of that was to detach the altar from the apse or the of the, or the back of the back wall of the of the of the church, and uh, 
the priest facing the faithful, the communion rail, which was almost like an, a symbolic division of the two liturgies. From here to the altar, you are not allowed to. <laughs> Comes out so that the body and the head will be united again. So that then under the presidency of the ministerial priesthood, the liturgical action will happen with the head and the body all together. So again, the liturgical reform of Vatican II did not happen in an arbitrary way as some people tend to think. It, was, it took almost a whole century of the liturgical movement to finally, with Pius X saying, people should sing, people should take communion, people should participate in the liturgy. You know what happened also with Pius X? Because Mass was still in Latin, and to allow the people to participate before him, you know, uh, that people will go with, to Mass with the, the, the Roman Missal for the people, and, uh, but it was only in Latin. They were not allowed for the people to have a translation so that they will know what was being said in the language that they understood. And so then people were looking at what the priest was saying in Latin on this page and they could see in English or in Spanish or any other language what was, the, what was being said in Latin. That's why people got used to the missalettes because they could not understand Latin. They could follow it in a bilingual missal. They got so used to it now that they are able to understand. They still feel that they are, have to be following the, the, the missalette. And it's like saying, please. It's like, like a kid that, is, that if you take away from, from him a, 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 a walker, they will feel insecure. You know how to walk now. Take away your walker. Leave it. You don't need it anymore. Oh, yes, I do. I am afraid that I'm going to fall. Leave the, 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 the missalette. The, the, the mass is done in your language. Just follow it. Just enter into the, into the game. Forget about being obsessed with what, what you have to follow and, or read the reading. The readings are meant to be heard because that's why the proclamation, not to be read along. The missalette is only an instrument for us Perhaps those who want to come to church early and want to see the, what are going to be the readings, I can read them ahead of time, but as they are not to be, they are not to meant to be read along. The, God, the, the word of God is being proclaimed, and I better be attentive to that proclamation rather than. I think that if that will be the case, then we will say, okay. Take 10 minutes, you read the readings, and then we will come to the, uh, to the next movement, which is going to be the, the homily. Okay, are you all finished reading? <laughs> no, this is the proclamation, and the proclamation should not be reading along. That's not what's happening. No, fortunately it's not, but we should challenge the people to leave their walker. <laughs> right. Many times 
many times in our cases, worship aids are needed because our liturgies are bilingual or trilingual. And so then, it, in that sense, it is an aid. But if, the, if you have a, a worship aid and your word is being proclaiming the word that you understand, you don't need it. Any other questions or comments? Going once. <laughs> then I'm done for today. Next week we're going to be looking at the, uh, lit the liturgical year. And in, within the liturgical year, we will be looking at what is called the uh, uh, the uh, how, uh, progressive solemnity. Progressive solemnity. If we go from bottom, we will we will go for uh, like a memorial that is optional memorial that is obligatory, a feast, and a solemnity. And, and all of those within the context of the liturgical year, we will look into that. And uh, so that also when, when you are able to say, okay, do we have to celebrate this Mass? Then look at what, what are we celebrating. And then if we have the option or we do not have an option. Okay? So, okay, thank you. Thank you.